There will be little friendliness in the Canadian skies as the federal government has brought in new air travel restrictions. The plug's been pulled on flights to sunny destinations traditionally inhabited by Canadians on holiday. For those who are returning from an international destination, they must reserve a room at a Government of Canada-approved hotel for three nights at their own cost and take a COVID-19 molecular test on arrival at their own cost. That could cost each person up to $2,000. Now, if you happen to be driving back across the border, as many snowbirds will be doing, they will also require a molecular COVID test 72 hours before arrival at the border. The federal government says its hand was forced by the variants of COVID, which are now here. Hello and welcome to the Unpublished Cafe. I'm Ed Hand. We're coming to you from a remote location and practicing physical distancing to enhance safety. The first variant case of COVID to arrive in Canada was back, back on Boxing Day. Now, the patients had not traveled, but came in contact with some people from the UK so much for staying in your own bubble. Our unpublished vote question asks, do you feel these new air travel restrictions are necessary? Yes, no, or unsure. You can log on and cast your ballot at unpublished.vote. Now, coming up on the Unpublished Cafe, we'll chat with Christine Van Guyne of the Canadian Constitution Foundation. She'll join us to discuss the legal ramifications and possible constitutional violations of the order. And later, we'll be joined by Stephanie Cusey, MP for Calgary, Midnapur. She's also the Conservative Transport Critic. But first, we will start with Carl Moore. He's Associate Professor at the Desotel Faculty of Management at McGill University. And Carl, these latest restrictions, is this worse for the industry compared to what happened at the beginning of the pandemic? Well, it, it was terrible both times. This is worse in the sense that they had began to recover. People were beginning to travel a bit. And now one of the most popular things to do in winter, it's snowing here in Montreal. I'm sure it's snowing in the undisclosed location you're at. It's something where we'd love to go down to uh, Mexico and, and the Caribbean. And that's shut down for the Canadian Airlines. Now, you might get there through the U.S., but this is really incredibly tough times. The worst times the aviation industry in Canada, indeed in the world, has ever seen, including SARS and 9-11. This is where they're down at times, they were down 90, 95% of their normal flights. So it's really, I mean, there's been um, almost 30,000 people laid off, if not more, in the Carolina, Car uh, Canadian airline industry alone. Tough times. Uh, how, how would you characterize the government's approach to the airline industry through this pandemic so far? Well, I mean, it's something where they've been saying some good things, and the Prime Minister man said some good things this morning, earlier today. But they haven't, uh, in my, my sense of it, matched to the U.S., the EU, parts of the Middle East, parts of Asia, countries that we'd look at to see how they treat their line industry. They haven't got, come up to those standards. Now, they're in negotiation, they're still negotiating, and that's fair enough. But it's something where a lot of the countries we'd look at ourselves for comparison to have stepped up to the plate more than the Canadian government has. And in stepping up to the plate, in, in which way? Well, financial is probably the main thing. Um, you know, certainly there's a health care crisis here, and there's a certain thing where we have to do the right thing as a country in terms of testing people and so on, and, and maybe Canada could have got to the testing sooner, as we've seen in a, some other parts of the world. But it's a thing where finances is a big part of it. And Canada is the second largest country in the world. We have, what, six time zones, uh, relatively small population. We need a vigorous airline industry to connect us from a business viewpoint, from a family viewpoint, and from a tourism viewpoint. You don't want to drive from Ottawa to Vancouver unless it's, you know, that's your whole vacation. It's just too big a, a country. And we need more than one airline. Uh, you may be old enough to remember under Brian Mulroney that Air Canada was part of the government. Yeah. We don't want to go back to those days. Uh, the government's good at some things. Running airlines is not one of them. So you need a competitive, and, and WestJet is a great competitor to Air Canada, vice versa. So it's something where we need a viable airline industry, and they do need financial support. They have some money in the bank. They're well managed. They have good records, but there's going to be limits to what they can do given how far down they've come. Do you feel the new restrictions are too onerous? Well, it's something where uh, that's a, there's two questions. One is a healthcare question, and a certain degree ago, 
Hey, here in Quebec, we're, you know, have a curfew uh, till uh, starting at eight at night till five in the morning. And it's absolutely quiet unless you have a dog. You're not outside. And retail stores have been closed for a month now. They're opening Monday. But it's been tough. But that may be the right healthcare thing to do is to shut down airlines. But when you look at it from a viewpoint of the airline industry, they are arguing with some evidence from other parts of the world that testing, if we do it now or done it earlier, but at this point we can't change the past, doing testing uh, can reduce the risk very substantially to make it where it's a relatively low risk activity to travel, to fly. I, I wonder, should this have been done back in the fall, these new restrictions, so Canadians in particular, snowbirds would not have gone south? Yeah, probably in retrospect, but it's easily, to, you know, it's easy in retrospect to be critical and point out the flaws. And to some degree, you know, you go, okay, well, let's learn for the next crisis. And uh, in some countries, they've, they've seen this before, where, um, you know, this is the fourth or fifth time they ran into this sort of thing. I was talking to someone in Shanghai, Canadian, uh, yesterday. I interviewed him for my radio show. He was talked to him for an hour, and he said, yeah, they've seen this in Shanghai three or four times before in the last 15 years he's lived there. So they're more used to it. We can learn from it, but at this point, let's look forward and what can we do to help the industry looking forward is more, I think, important at this at this juncture. You know, the uh, federal government said it was brought in these new restrictions because of the new variants that were out there. And I wonder, the sunny destinations got the axe, but you still, you had the UK variant, you had the South Africa variant, and, and you didn't have any real closure on those two countries. Well, certainly it's much more much more careful now. And that's a fair point. Look at the uh, variants and so on. And it's partly is how many hospital cases do we have in Canada? How many people are dying? Where, who's it impacting? Those are some of the questions the healthcare people have to look at. And, and they don't have 100% knowledge, but they have very good guess. And we, we go with what they have to say. But the government can support the airline industry and look at uh, loaning money, helping them out, uh, you know, maybe canceling airport fees. And the fairly high taxes we have in Canada on tickets. So there's some things the government can do and I think should do, and I, they're in the midst of negotiating that. It's just really taking a longer time than one would anticipate. If you cancel the airline fees, is that not money the airports are out? Well, it's, at one level, it's money the government's out, like taxes, the airport right, okay. fees. Now, the airports are separate entities but are funded to some degree by Canadian taxpayers and the government. So there's some things they could do there that the government could support the airports rather than the airlines directly but the same net result is that the airlines keep uh keep uh, from going bankrupt carl what's the what what are you going to be looking for in the next say two months regarding the airline industry and the impact of these new restrictions well i think they need to get it you know and they're working on that more testing better testing it's a, it, if you have everybody COVID-19 tested a couple of days ahead of time, it's a very small risk being on a plane. I've flown four times, uh, you know, Montreal, Toronto, back and forth since the pandemic. And I had tours of the Montreal and Toronto airports by the people who were looking after the safety side and the healthcare side and came away convinced that it's uh, a safe activity if everybody wears their masks, and particularly on short flights like that. Mm -hmm. So I think if, if we follow the regulations, do the testing, we can get it to be a safe, doable activity, certainly with our own country, and increasingly as things improve in other parts of the world to help our tourism and our airline industry. So I think that's the big thing to work on, plus government support for, these, uh, industry, for the industry. Carl, I want to thank you for joining us. Always a pleasure. Carl Moore is Associate Professor at the Desertel Faculty of Management at McGill University. The new restrictions have created some anxiety and some anger in particular about the timing. To get the legal view, I'm pleased to be joined by Christine Van Gein. She's litigation director at the Canadian Constitution Foundation. And Christine, you call these measures draconian. How so? I mean, I, I think part of the problem is the lack of information at this point, because a lot of people are panicking about being forced into these quarantine hotels. I think the, what makes them so draconian or, or overkill is the fact that individuals who are returning to Canada are already required to quarantine in their homes for 14 days. To impose a three-day stay at a hotel where we don't know 
if people's special needs will be accommodated, their dietary limits, what happens to large families, will they be, will they be separated in a different room? I mean, um, all of these all of these details need to be explained, but in the absence, there's a huge panic, and it seems like it's taking things a little too far when people are already required to have two COVID tests and quarantine in their homes. Is, is the issue with you that non-essential doesn't seem to be clear? Yeah, so it's, it's not just the question of what's essential or not, it's the question of what is going to be exempt or not. Um, you know, people who are are traveling um, for a medical reason, for example, to get surgery in the United States or to have the medical treatment for a child, when they return, are these quarantine facilities going to accommodate those special medical needs or are those people going to be exempt and be permitted to quarantine at home? Um, that's a, a really big concern for a lot of people. I could understand th those because there are exemptions, right? And of course, I we don't we don't know the exemptions yet. At this point, the exemptions have not been announced, and it's been a week now since the policy was announced. All right. So I, I'm going to bet that there, you know a lot of that stuff, and they have said that there are going to be exemptions. Not it just hasn't been clear. But what part of strongly advise Canadians to avoid non-essential travel isn't clear? That's the, the issue I think a lot of people have with the people who are complaining about the restrictions right now. Yeah, I know people don't feel bad. The public doesn't feel bad for people who went to a beach vacation. No. But I think we should think about what is essential travel and what will be defined as essential under this order, um, because presumably it, it could change. Um, is, is someone traveling for work, for example, in the film industry, is that going to be considered essential? Is someone who works in oil going to be exempt? Is that essential? Um, what about people who are in cross-border relationships? You know, I've been contacted by hundreds of people, and I, I didn't know how common it is to have a cross-border marriage, not just relationship, but marriage, where um, the children will be on one side of the border and one of the parents is on the other. And now there's an additional $2,000 cost associated with just being with your family. There are people who have traveled for compassionate reasons. Will that be considered essential? Someone who's traveled to help care for a sick or dying parent or sibling or to attend a funeral. Those things should be considered essential travel. We should have compassion for those people. And it's very concerning that there now could be this a uh, $2,000 price tag associated with that travel and that these individuals will not be permitted to quarantine in their home. What about the snowbirds? Look, I, I know that there's not a lot of sympathy for snowbirds right. either, but I will say if I was in an age bracket where I'm at a high risk and the federal government in Canada has failed to procure for me a vaccine, I would do everything in my power to get vaccinated. And that includes going to Florida to get vaccinated. And I think that that's a reason a lot of snowbirds have traveled to the United States. They're now going to be vaccinated. Will they be exempt from the travel requirement? And, and why wouldn't they be if the ability to spread the virus is, is limited if it exists at all? So these are all questions that the government needed to, needs to clarify. Um, we want to know how how these individuals are going to be treated. Christine Van Gein is joining us on the Unpublished Cafe. She's litigation director with the Canadian Constitution Foundation as we talk about the new travel restrictions for Canadians that were imposed at the beginning of the month. Now, testing at the airport would probably resolve a lot of the problem. What are the issues that are getting in the way of the situation right now? I mean, I, I don't think that there, I mean, having a test could be, or you could argue that it's a, it's a violation of your bodily integrity, which is protected under the charter under Section 7. But, you know, our, our rights are not absolute. The courts would likely show deference to the government decision that testing on um, and getting on a plane and then exiting the plane is probably a reasonable limit on our, um, on our rights. So, the testing itself is not as big of an issue as a prohibitively expensive hotel stay that might be completely unnecessary. The government hasn't given us any evidence that travelers are failing to quarantine at home. You know, they're already required to, to stay in their home for 14 days. 
in the absence of proof that people are violating that, I think there have only been like 180 tickets handed out for uh, people who failed to, to quarantine properly once arriving in Canada. You know, it's, it doesn't appear to be a widespread problem. And I think that requiring these hotel quarantine stays is taking a bit of a sledgehammer approach and can do a, can do a lot of damage. You know, for a family of four at $2,000 a piece, you probably can't return to Canada. Like, who can afford that? Well, then, then perhaps they should not have gone south in the first place. You know, it's it's easy to say that, but if you, you know, I've talked to people who are traveling with their children who require medical care in the United States. You know, a, a woman who I spoke to, she and her two children are going to to California to go to a cutting edge hospital where her daughter needs regular treatment that's not available in Canada. Are they going to have to pay $2,000 a person to return when when her daughter is medically compromised? Are they going to stay have to stay in one of these quarantine hotels where you get, I mean, I we all saw this, this story in the Toronto Sun where the quarantine or self-isolation hotels seem to be feeding, feeding people, you know, a slice of bread and a, and a whole tomato is their lunch. You know, is that, that's not going to meet the medical needs of a child who's just had a, a serious treatment. Um, so these are all really, really major problems that could infringe on our rights, and we need the details from the government, and a week later, we still don't have them. So the the issue to you is the, the exemptions more than anything else. So people who decide that they're going to, they're, you know, they're going to ignore the, 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 the directions and they're going to go on, on holidays, that they're off to the side. But the people with the medical exemptions, possibly compassionate exemption, that kind of a situation, those are the people you're concerned about. Those who decide that they're just going to go on holidays and whatever happens, happens, you're not concerned about. I mean, I'm still concerned because there's still an argument that their constitutional rights are engaged. But I think that the most more compelling in rights that are going to be at, at issue here are people who need medical accommodation or people who are traveling with large families for some type of compassionate reason. And it would be actually harmful for them to stay in this facility. You know, the, are the rooms big enough to accommodate, you know, if you are traveling with, with a bunch of young children, if you have several children, are the rooms going to accommodate all the children with you in the same room? Or are you going to be separated from your children? These are the emails that I'm getting from, from hundreds of Canadians who are worried about this. And, you know, we don't have the answers. Mm -hmm. uh, my hope is that these people will be accommodated. I think the government has a, an obligation to accommodate these people, but we we think it's completely reckless that the government has announced a policy without providing people with the details and left these individuals and families in a full-blown panic. Now, you, you folks have a, a petition going right now. How's the response been so far? We've already had over a thousand signatures on this petition, and we launched it, I think, on uh, Wednesday afternoon. So, um, and in addition to those signatures, I have received over the course of the weekend. Um, or the, the past week, um, I was getting an email like every five minutes on the first two days of this announcement. So it's it's slowed down a, a bit now, but I have had hundreds of emails from panicked families who are who are who are traveling for really reasons should, we should have compassion for. Like they're separated from their spouse, they're traveling for medical care. I really didn't get a lot of emails from people who are just on vacation. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, Christine, I want to thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me on. Christine Van Gein is the litigation director with the Canadian Constitution Foundation. Someone who has been watching these new travel restrictions is Stephanie Cusey. She's the MP for Calgary, Midnapore, and the conservative transport critic. And she joins us now. And Stephanie, what are your biggest concerns about the new air travel restrictions? Well, I think there are two concerns. The first one is how we got here. Um, I know that as the official opposition, me and my colleagues, we've been pushing the government for months to adopt other tools that would have not brought us to this point. Uh, things such as va better vaccine distribution, of course, which we're seeing as a horrible fail, but also rapid testing, testing on arrival, testing before departure. And many of these pilots have been set up across the country by industry, um, but my point is that really it is the government's failure to use these tools, implement these tools that have brought us 
to this point. And my second concern is the way that it has been implemented both times, both very last minute sledgehammer reactions, which forces Canadians to respond and industry to respond. And it's just not fair. So for both of these reasons and more, I'm very concerned. Well, I, I would say that uh, the, the restrictions that have leveled this time around compared to the last time around, two different situations, because you had no vaccine at the beginning. You really had no choice but to lock down the border and lock down air travel, did you not? Yeah, no, and that's my point exactly, Ed, is that we've had a year to accommodate uh, this pandemic. I understand the fear and the concern around the virus, especially around the new variants. But the government has had a year to evaluate many tools. And some of those, as I said before, rapid testing, testing on arrival. We're hearing more about uh, antivirals and treatments. And they need to do a better job of implementing those. Um, otherwise, we, who knows when this will end? It will, it will be without end at this point if they don't get their act together and seriously consider and make a plan for how we're going to live with this, what looks like right now indefinitely. Now, you've called for a detailed plan for airlines. Um, and I'm wondering what, what uh, I guess, definite action would a conservative government have done when it comes to air travel in this situation? Well, we certainly would have implemented many of these things that I talked about, uh, rapid testing, testing on arrival, testing on departure, which has been very good at uh, locating those infected and as well the different variants. The McMaster study is particularly compelling uh, where it does three points of testing. And here in Alberta, we have the pilot program where we could actually reduce quarantine as a result of the implementation of these systems and, and, and frankly, just uh, statistics and science. So I think we would have done those things as well, looking around the world. We would have implemented other things such as safe corridors and really looked at science in terms of transparency of data where transmission is is really occurring um, and, and I think in addition to being transparent with the information it also provides more information to the public and it calms the fear and the chaos that we're seeing right now Ed so I think we would have implemented a lot of the things that we've been suggesting and we would have been a lot more transparent about uh, the information that we knew in an effort to not only guide our action but provide comfort and assurance to the public, which, frankly, this government has not. If anything, they have created more of it. Now, I, I'm, I'm kind of curious, you know, the, the situation, we've got a lot of travelers uh, who went to the States, went, uh, you know, down south, that kind of a th situation. We've got an order or we've got a directive from the federal government about avoiding all non-essential travel. So what a conservative government made it more clear and just said there will be no non-essential travel until this is under under control? You know, I think the Conservative Party is really the party, looking back in history and just in principle, that has respected the rights and freedoms of Canadians um, in general and taken the responsibility to do whatever is necessary to ensure that Canadians can have um, the most fullest lives possible. So again, I think it's it's a matter of this, all the things that weren't done and the steps that weren't taken and the planning that wasn't done by this federal government that brought us to this place. And I think you would have seen that the conservative approach would have been entirely uh, different, one based on action, one based on information. And I, I really think we would, we would be in a better place um, from both a health and safety perspective because we would have acted sooner but also I think from a, a quality of life perspective because we would have understand Canadians are, are good people they follow the rules they do what's asked of them by their governments but also as the government it's your responsibility um, to yes most importantly protect Canadians but also put in place uh, the the tools which are available um, to allow for the greatest quality of, of life possible. Um, you know, I, and I, I think of exactly the examples you're referring to, all the vacations that have been canceled. Mm -hmm. My son's uh, hockey season this year was just terminated this past week um, for good. And as you know, these things have devastating effects on mental health. And so 
I think you would have seen a completely different approach from the very beginning from a conservative government. You know, you're, you're concerned the Canadian airline industry can't compete internationally right now. And, you know, Canadians aren't supposed to be traveling anyway, unless it's essential. So how do you balance that? The, the competition, yet, really, there's not supposed to be a lot of business happening until this pandemic is pretty well figured out. That That is, it's a great question. And I think that it is, again, two things. Once again, it's what I've been referring to throughout this conversation, and that is implementing the tools, <clears throat> excuse me, which we have, uh, rapid testing, I re refer to these pilots. So I think if, if those systems were systematically in place across the country, we'd see a higher level of comfort amongst Canadians. Um, that their safety was guarded and, and that all of the uh, precautions based on the tools available were being made to them. And then I think the second part, Ed, is um, just having a plan to bridge this airline sector through the end of this pandemic, or as, as I said, to really, uh, since it seems indefinite right now, to what will be the new normal or the integration back back to normal. And as I've said previously as well, the government has done a bad job on both of these things, implementing the tools and coming up with a, uh, a plan of, of sustainability and frankly, at this point, survival, because there will come a point where this, li where this lifts or where Canadians decide, forget it, I'm going to Disneyland. And I'm not sure if they'll be able to right now or it will be a lot more difficult without um, certainly having several stopovers or using an American carrier, which as you know, has still been allowed to operate to some destinations. Um, and so it's, I think that, um, again, there are a number of things this government could, could have done. I think that Canadians, of, of course, they are um, consumed by public safety and well-being of themselves and their families and their communities. But as I said before, if this would have been managed better from the beginning, I think that Canadians would feel more confident and more empowered to live their lives with information and with tools. Now, you, you mentioned the uh, the rapid testing. In, in, obviously, rapid testing is, is not a cheap endeavor, but it's obviously essential if you're going to have a safer airline industry. In terms of rapid testing, who pays for that? Is that, the, is that going to be the consumer? Is that going to be the province? Is that the federal government? Well, I mean, that's a good question. And I think that if something was implemented nationally, as it should be, and we're talking here specific to the airline sector, uh, Sector, excuse me, because I think rapid testing has the incredible opportunity to open up all sorts of industries and all sorts of aspects mm -hmm. of society, which we have lost. Um, but relative to the airline sector, I think that would have to be um, a discussion and evaluated, whether that was a um, provincial cost or a federal cost, some of the pilots, both the province and the feds shared the expense of, or I wouldn't even be surprised um, if it was implemented. We see air port improvement taxes all the time, some type of fee um, for the for the service upon the airport. I'm not I'm not um, advocating for any one of those three options, but they're the options off the top of my head when I consider the implementation. What would you like to see financially from the federal government for the airline industry? Well, I certainly would like to see them um, come up with some type of plan, and, and I would say seriously evaluate it. We've seen all sorts of different other tools used by other nations around the world, and G that includes G7. We look at the CARES Act across the border in the United States, um, and some have gone with an equity model. I, don't re I wouldn't really encourage that. I think that's going backward in in history for Canada. Um, some have gone with a, a, a bailout scenario, and I know that uh, the Conservative government has done this uh, historically with other sectors, but I don't think that this would, it would be our preferred thing. Um, you know, I think what we would explore the, the most, if we were absolutely uh, left with no, no option, or even just to mm -hmm. Just to consider and evaluate would be some type of debt format, which is what the airlines have been have been looking at. But we'd have to again 
um, evaluate that, evaluate, evaluate the terms, evaluate um, public sentiment, because there are, there are many Canadians that wouldn't be willing to, um, to b- bail out any sector, even in this uh, yeah. difficult time. And many businesses that would say, hey, why is this industry getting bailed out and, and why not? So it's, it's a good question. I have my thoughts about uh, where we would lean and, and what we would do, but I can't say for certain because we're, we're not in the government and we haven't been put in the position um, to make a decision. But, I, you know, I come back to... Um, obviously money does seem like um, the the big thing but I guess when I refer back to uh, what we've seen done is nothing there's just there's been no no plan and it's it's been bits and pieces and the region uh, the northern regional route great Um, the the queues uh, which which was only so helpful for so long for so many people but there was never ever a coordinated plan and I even if we would have considered the different uh, tools that I've talked about throughout this conversation, um, then maybe the, again, maybe even the financial situation wouldn't be as dire for these, their, these airlines. Maybe somehow they would have been able to have cobbled together um, a, a, sur- a survival plan if they had been equipped better to, to do so in, in other, with, with other tools other than financing. Stephanie, I want to thank you for joining us. It's been a pleasure. I've had a lot of fun, and I'm certainly, you can't have been implicated in the way I've been in the last six months without feeling passionate about this and without having, you know, beyond the, the numbers. And I, again, as a conservative, I recognize the, the value of the taxpayer and how hard it is to make a dollar. But man, oh, man, let me tell you, I hear from these workers on a daily basis and the unions and you, you would cry to read the stack of letters I get from pilots, uh, the pictures I get with them in their uniforms, holding their kids. Um, it's, it's devastating, and again, it is completely at the hands of this government that, that failed them in so many ways. And unfortunately, as I stated a lot in the last couple of weeks, this has moved beyond the airline sector. Can, all Canadians now are paying for the failures of this government. Stephanie Cusey is the MP for Calgary, Midnapore, and Conservative Transport Critic. Now it's time for our unpublished dot vote question. Do you feel these new air travel restrictions are necessary? Yes, no, or unsure? You can vote right now at unpublished dot vote and have your voice heard. I want to thank our guest today, Carl Moore, Associate Professor of the Desotel Faculty of Management at the McGill University. Christine Van Gein is Litigation Director with the Canadian Constitution Foundation. And Stephanie Cusey is the MP for Calgary, Midnapore, and the Conservative Transport Critic. I want to thank you for listening to the Unpublished Cafe. Stay safe. I'm Ed Hand.